Does anyone have an idea why uh, people study two-dimensional systems as opposed to three-dimensional systems? They are, simpler than three -dimensional. they are just a lower dimensional problem, so there's fewer integrals, right? <laughs> your, your dimensionality or your, your space is just smaller. So, um, but they will still have phase transitions, right? Uh, right. So, so it becomes a big issue in two-dimensional systems because you have, um, I introduced this a little bit in my first part of my talk, is you have in two dimensions what's referred to as the Merman-Wagner theorem that says that you shouldn't have continuous phase transitions in two dimensions. So primarily that rules out second-order phase transitions. However, uh, when it comes to actual numerical work, all of that only applies to systems actually in a thermodynamic limit. When you have a finite system, you can still get those kinds of phase transitions. So if you're really trying to understand um, the solution to a Hamiltonian with the intention of solving an infinite system, but your system that you actually compute is truncated, like 10 lattice sites by 10 lattice sites or something like that, then you're still going to get phase transitions, right? So the, the physics you get out is somehow wrong compared to the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about how we try and cope with some of that stuff. Uh, right, uh, then later sections I'll talk again about the extensions of Hubbard models, okay? But I just want to focus on this for now. <clears throat> so it's a common problem in essentially all of science that uh, you would say to yourself, I cannot understand the details of a problem, it's just too complicated, okay? So you ask, what is the simplest system you actually can understand? And you propose some sort of model system. And then you, once you've solved that model system, then you have to ask the question, what, from that solution, what can you actually infer about the original problem that you intended on solving? Okay? People do this all the time in biology, for example. They take complicated um, uh, lipid bilayers, and they, they throw out most of the junk that's in them, and they put only the components that they're interested in. Uh, people do this in, for example, electronic structure, where you focus only on the low-lying bands. Uh, Lichtenstein showed some of this stuff. These are band structures for graphene that around some specific point in momentum space have this sort of uh, cone structure. And so you can actually get very far doing a lot in graphene by throwing out all of the details of all of these high energy bands and only focus on the low energy band and replace the Hamiltonian with some just effective Hamiltonian. And a lot of the physics works out really fundamentally correct. Okay? So this is the idea. You're going to take a problem you want to solve and you're going to reduce it to some smaller effective model. And we know from ideas of a normalization group that there's often a lot of key physics that's correct by integrating out high energy modes and only keeping long wavelength physics. <clears throat> so this is your uh, elementary school Coulomb interaction where you draw with a crayon a couple of charges that are interacting with each other. So what we ultimately want to be able to solve is a general Hamiltonian that takes into account the kinetic energy and the potential energies of all the particles in a system on some lattice. And that potential energy we know from my uh, XKCD comic is simply a Coulomb interaction. Okay? So that's really the goal. It's what you'd like to be doing. In, in physics, we are trying to find a reduced system that somehow throws out a lot of the degrees of freedom that makes a problem a little bit more tractable. So the Hubbard model was introduced actually as a, as a, a tool to try and understand insulating behavior. And it's written this way. It con contains a kinetic hopping term, which was discussed uh, in good detail uh, yesterday by Guy. And it contains a potential energy term. And instead of a complicated dependence on uh, lattice spacings, the idea is instead of having a, a divergent potential for two uh, particles on the same site, instead to just have a, a constant, okay? So you have a constant repulsion or an energy cost for putting two electrons, one spin up and one spin down, on the same lattice site, okay? So if you, this is a lattice site, Guy went through this yesterday, is you have four possible configurations, is you can have no electron on the lattice site, you could have a spin up, you could have a spin down, or you could have two. Okay? <clears throat> so this is a little bit interesting because you've taken, I mean, it's, it's not obvious that there should really be any connection <laughs> between these two problems. One, in one case, you have a Coulomb interaction that clearly has some long-range interaction. Right? 
So there must be long range correlations in the system. And you've replaced it with an interaction that's complete, completely local. So but the, the trick is that um, there's some hidden physics which never really appears in your Hamiltonian and that has to do with poly exclusion. So there's an implicit uh, long range interaction that comes about just due to poly exclusion. <clears throat> And this actually, even within a local interaction, gives rise to finite correlation lengths, okay? Or finite interaction length scales. So, just to remind, this is what we're looking at. We have kinetic terms, which look like hopping amplitudes, or probabilities of jumping between different lattice sites. And we have a local interaction. And again, the idea was to take a complicated space of a problem and reduce it. So within these four configurations, three of the four produce a zero in your Hamiltonian. Okay? So most of the information is being thrown out and you're only penalizing double occupancy. However, <clears throat> there's a caveat here, which is in order to write down the energies of your system, you still have the same kind of fundamental problem that you have in the Coulomb interaction, which is you still need to know where every electron in your system is. In, in a classical context, okay? So it's uh, not actually substantially simpler than, than the, the full problem. <clears throat> okay, so the, the idea is that the Hubbard model is a model for interacting electron systems. It's not intended to be a real representation of particular materials. However, there are specific <coughs> materials that uh, for which uh, Hubbard models are particularly keen. Um, there are, uh, there's been a lot of work that's been done in the last, I don't know, 40 years on Hubbard models, but there still remain long-standing physics questions. Um, the ground state phases of this model are not rigorously understood. Uh, the details of, of how magnetism uh, versus charge ordering plays a role um, even within simple lattices like square lattices, not necessarily understood. At low temperatures, you can have the formation of stripes or density wave or spatial charge ordering. <clears throat> In the case of, um, so one of the, the key applications of the Hubbard model is as an effective low energy model for high temperature <coughs> cuprate superconductors. And the reason is that those materials such as, uh, here this is a, an image of a complicated material, yttrium, barium, copper oxide. High TC cuprates have copper oxide planes, and if you throw, essentially have an effective model for those copper oxide planes, it basically looks like a, a square lattice of copper ions. Okay? So it appears as a low energy effective model for cuprate superconductors. And cuprates have a complicated phase diagram as a function of doping. When they're the stoichiometric compound, they're typically antiferromagnetic insulators, and as you dope the system, here this is a small diagram for hole doping, you get eventually a superconducting phase. So by doping I mean you put some, uh, here I don't have it written in the chemical formula, but you put some uh, chemical uh, oxygen or strontium that uh, removes uh, electrons from these copper oxide planes, so you're effectively uh, changing the chemical potential of the system. Okay. <coughs> um, so within the cuprates, one of the long-standing problems, for example, is the existence of a strange phase referred to as a pseudogap. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So in a lot of ways, um, it turns out that the Hubbard model actually uh, contains most of the same phases. Okay? So it's really thought that it, it is a good representation of a low energy effective model for the cuprates. <coughs> the Hubbard model has also uh, drawn attention from cold, atoms exper cold atom experiments. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that one of the ways to solve a problem is to generate a machine that exactly mimics the problem you're trying to solve. So one of the ways to do that is to generate in, an, in a lab. Uh, this is a picture of a lab from uh, the University of Alberta from another uh, LeBlanc, uh, who's a, a prof there. Um, uh, I don't know what all this is. Experimentalists really love to show imagery of their, like to go into their labs and take photos of their apparatus. But so I like the cartoon picture, is it creates a lattice, <laughs> okay? And in there are cold atoms, 
and they can tune the interactions between those atoms to mimic uh, model Hamiltonian. Okay? And when they do that, they can then look at something like the density as a function of chemical potential, however they control their chemical potential. And they'll, they'll get curves, and they'll compare them to, for example, uh, 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 different numerical techniques like NLCE, or uh, they did some comparisons to some of our, our work from back in the day. <coughs> so this is an attempt at solving a model Hamiltonian in an experimental lab. Okay? Now this is a little bit of a cyclical justification because the cold atom experimentalists say that they want to solve that problem because theorists working on Hubbard models want to solve that problem. So you sort of have a cyclical justification. But there's an external justification which is ultimately you want to develop tools which let you solve the general many electron problem where you just have Coulomb type interactions, where you have multi-band systems, where your complexity of ions grows, okay? things that density functional theory try and uh, apply to, but in a rigorous and controlled manner. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about is uh, metal insulator transitions. <coughs> so there's a couple ways to get metal insulator transitions. Um, the first is through electron-electron interactions, and you may have heard of a Mott transition. So the basic idea of a Mott transition is that you can have a very clean system, and if it interacts in a periodic crystal, if you have a, a large enough um, interaction, okay, is that you can actually break your density of states into two bands, a lower Hubbard band and an upper Hubbard band. Okay? Um, Liechtenstein last week talked quite a bit about these things. He could see them in his density functional theory calculations coming out somewhat naturally. Uh, another option is through disorder, through something like an Anderson uh, transition, which occurs in non-interacting disordered systems where you have some disorder in a material, uh, and you can actually form localization. So there's a lot of debate right now as to how separate these two ideas are, um, but that results in spatial confinement of electrons, and you can imagine if your electrons are spatially confined, that must result in something that appears to be an insulating uh, type phase. Now, the Hubbard model itself is actually only solvable in one dimensions and infinite dimensions, <coughs> which are not very useful limits necessarily. Um, and I'm quite a fan of this uh, quote. It, that being the Hubbard model, has yet to receive adequate mathematical treatment, so one has to resort to the indignity of numerical simulations to settle even the simplest questions about it. Okay? So I put this quote up because it's sort of a warning that everything that comes after this comes from some numerical procedure. So at some stage, I'll mention a little bit about some of those numerical techniques, but we're not really equipped at this stage to go through all the details. Okay? So I'll show you results, and all of those results have caveats. All of those results have approximations, and all of those results are in some way kind of a little bit wrong, or they have uncertainties that have to be handled and treated. Okay? So we will discuss some numerical tools. All right, so there is, there is a general picture from quantum criticality of what should happen in low dimensional systems as you go through a quantum critical phase transition, which can only exist in 2D at t equals 0. Okay? So you're only explicitly allowed to have that phase transition uh, in some systems anyways. Uh, exactly at t equals zero. So um, uh, I'm missing some references here. I'll, I'll maybe go back and uh, if I find time and add in a reference here because this is a little bit uh, vague. But the basic idea is you'll see this kind of imagery repeatedly with different um, different parameters along this x-axis. So the idea that on one side of some of some uh, controllable uh, parameter in your model. On one side you have an insulator and on the other side you have a metal. And then you have some giant crossover region where the system goes from being metallic to insulator. And through there you might come up with other words to describe these things like bad metals. Whatever that means. Okay? And often what ends up happening is that the details of this get hidden with a superconducting dome. Okay? So this is um, one of the things that people try and understand is how 
does this low temperature phase transition, which occurs, how does it sort of vanish, at least what has, has been observed numerically, and at high temperatures, how do you have some sort of crossover instead of a necessarily a phase transition? So this is some much older data. Uh, this basic picture was already shown uh, last week by Liechtenstein. But what, you, uh, what is being uh, illustrated here is the diagram of the temperature as a function of the interaction strength U. Okay? And over here, we have a Fermi liquid. And over here, we have a Mott insulator. And there are actually two lines, UC1 and UC2. And you'll see this in the literature all the time. And the reason for that is that you have uh, actually a first order phase transition. And because it's a first order phase transition, you can have a hysteresis process. So if you approach from one direction, from a Fermi liquid, you don't turn into an insulator until UC2. And vice versa, I believe if you are a Mott insulator, you don't turn into a Fermi liquid until you hit UC1. Okay. But at high uh, temperatures, there may not be an explicit phase transition, but instead some just gradual crossover. Okay, Because remember, the definition of a first order phase transition says that you have some observable, and it has to have a discontinuous jump. right? But at some high temperature, that discontinuous jump might simply turn <coughs> to that. Now, because we're talking about phase transitions, it's not allowed that this is purely some thermal smearing of the problem. right? Typically, what you actually see is that as you go up in temperature, this will sort of close. And eventually, you hit this point up at the top here, which is written TC, at which, above which you're no longer talking actually about a phase transition. You're talking about what people refer to as a crossover. Okay? where you've lost the ability to explicitly define some order parameter, but you still have some change overall in some macroscopic observable. OK? Yeah? Are there known examples when uh, first order phase transition turns into the second order phase transition? Yeah. When, when this gap closes, Right, so let me, just, let me just draw that so that um, so you, I, I think uh, what you're saying is going from this picture to you know, this picture and then finally closing it. So it's gone from a first order problem to a second order problem. I don't know that it's impossible. But it doesn't happen in this problem. So that's all I can say. Okay? Uh, it's a great question. So this is a very long standing problem. Uh, this diagram was also shown uh, last week by Liechtenstein. Uh, and I put a number of references that you can go to look up some of these data sets that, sh sorry, I apologize, should have appeared on the earlier slides. So there's uh, 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 an older paper by Park and uh, Haule and Kotlier from 2008, which identified this CDMFT. Uh, transition um, versus the dynamical mean field transition, you see that these things are quite a bit different. I'll talk a little bit uh, about that and what are the differences between some of these methods. And then more recently in 2015, you have another method called dynamical uh, vertex approximation that comes in and puts on the same graph a plot over here that says we have a metal and we have an insulator. Okay? So how is it that within a numerical community we're allowed to have such wide deviation in results. Does anybody have uh, thoughts on, on what this is? So at least the argument here is that the, the difference between the far right and the far left is finite size effects. Okay, So the far right is the solution of an impurity problem which I'll talk about, um, where we put a single lattice site and we put it in a mean field bath and we solve the dynamical mean field problem, which I'll explain later. <coughs> the second case is a cluster problem where you have maybe 16 of such sites coupled to a bath and you solve the same problem. So the system has gotten bigger and that line of phase transitions has shifted to the left. 
And it turns out, at least all evidence seems to point this way, is that increasing the system size further and further pushes that line of phase transitions further over. Now this is a big, a big debate because there are fundamental definitions of where these lines are, are expected to cross zero, which are defining these numbers, UC1 and UC2, which are thought to be some you know, fundamental elements of the model. And if those numbers are changing with system size, and at least in this particular calculation, making a suggestion that it tends towards zero, these are very different physical interpretations of the model. Okay? So this remains a um, uh, not understood, not solved problem within the Hubbard model. Yeah? So do you understand correctly that this basically the U on the horizontal axis is basically where the, the, where the Fermi energy goes so far that it exits a band, control, right? Through bands? Yes, basically, yeah. Yep. So, so both methods find completely different eigenvalues. Yes. I mean, that would be the only way to conclude if one says you have a metal and the other says that you have an insulator, uh, then you must have very different eigenvalues, right? Your density of states must look totally different. Okay. okay? So finite size effects are a substantial issue. Okay? And uh, I'll, I'll make a couple of statements as to what, what those sizes are at some stage. So this is a nice paper. Um, uh, uh, this guy, Eric Van Loon, has been doing a lot of uh, dual fermion calculations, which is something Liechtenstein talked about uh, a few days ago. It's fairly recent. It's on the archive. And it was a study within uh, what's called the second order dual fermion calculation. Um, and here they look at a different metric, which is minus beta g of beta over 2. And the reason they look at that is that, at least in the low temperature limit, and this has to do with the definitions of Matsubara uh, objects. So what they look at is minus beta, the Green's function at tau is equal to beta over 2. Okay. So uh, yesterday I introduced Matsubara frequencies, but I didn't talk too much about the Fourier transform. So just like uh, omega has a Fourier transform to time, I omega n, and that's a bare frequency, has a Fourier transform to tau. And tau has an advantage in that the Green's functions are actually uh, periodic or antiperiodic, depending on fermionic or bosonic degrees of freedom, between tau is equal to 0 uh, to tau is equal to beta. Okay? So you don't need to understand the dynamics of a problem from 0 to infinity. You have some finite range you need to solve the problem. And it happens that if you were to plot a Green's function as a function of tau, you might get something like this. And its value at beta over 2, at the halfway point, actually has a proportionality to the density of states at omega equals 0 with prefactors. And it's really a spectral function, et cetera. There's some details. So it is at towards, now this is only accurate ac actually at t equals 0. And these calculations are not at t equals 0. But it's at least a metric to understand what's going on at the density of states. Okay? Or sorry, the density of states at the Fermi level. If the density of states at the Fermi level tends to 0, then you must actually be an insulator. Okay? So what they see is as a function of temp So at each temperature, as they decrease in temperature, below some temperature, they actually start to see a sharp drop, a sharp change in this particular quantity. Okay? <clears throat> um, and this has been observed in other cases. For example, these are just uh, DMFT uh, calculations. Uh, in this case, there's a little bit of complexity, but they're also showing some hysteresis. And so you can see the hysteresis here in the terms that as you go down in temperature, you have a red curve and a blue curve. So that says that if you come from low interactions, you'll have a transition at one point. But if you actually start the problem at large interactions, and I'll describe later the details of what that means, if you start from a, the assumption that your system is strongly interacting and come down, you'll get a slightly different transition temperature. <clears throat> so in this picture, there's, a, there's another complication. And oh, yep. And then, so did they do like experimental studies using STM or ARPES for di just a range of different dopings of a semiconductor? 
So most semiconductors are probably not well modeled by Hubbard interactions, though. So, so there's lots of STM on such materials, but those materials don't really contain this kind of transition. Now there's uh, STM and ARPES on high TC cuprates. Okay? And at least near half filling, the Hubbard model is supposed to be a good model. And indeed, you can get uh, gaps opening, but there's some, a lot of complexity there. And people are largely distracted by the fact there's some uh, anomalous pseudo-gap behavior. And I'll talk in a little bit about what that means. That's, that's a weird phase in which some part of momentum space becomes gapped, and some other part does not. Okay. Can, can you expand really quickly on why it's a Hubbard model is not a good model for the semiconductors? Well, semiconductors, <coughs> semiconductors uh, don't have a complete band gap, right? Because they're semiconductors, so they have something that resembles a gap, but it's not a complete gap. Um, so, presumably, you could create a Hubbard model that mimicked that. It would be some weak coupling Hubbard model. Um, but when you're already... It's essentially non-interacting. Yeah, I think it's already it's weakly interacting. Band, standard non-interacting band theory gap. So, so you can primarily, I think, just do, like, if you needed to understand the interactions, you could actually put in Coulombic-type interactions and do low-order perturbation theories to try and get some corrections of your non-interacting problem. So you probably don't need to reduce the, the, the problem already to use. So um, Lichtenstein talked a lot about density functional theory. Okay? So for those semiconductor materials, density functional theories give you the right band structure. Not just the right band structure, but all of the details correctly. Okay? And so, so those materials are just like you put a check mark next to them. Those are, those are basically solved. The problem comes when you look at a material like well, the, the cuprates are one of those materials where the half-filled problem from density functional theory originally, um, back when those materials were uh, discovered, predicted those materials would be metals when, in fact, they were insulators. Okay? And it's only by extending density functional theory to include U-type interactions that they can force the problem to become insulating. Okay? Okay. Does that make sense? OK, so one of the reasons why you get this sort of plethora of phases in here, too, or another complexity that comes in, is that there is the possibility that you have different metrics to represent that phase transition. So we can talk about metal insulator transitions from an effective mass m star. So how many of you have done Fermi liquid theory? Only a couple of hands. Can you guys be honest? How many of you have? Done Fermi liquid theory. Okay, so not very many. Okay, well, that's fine. So I've shown you this Green's function before, um, and in the denominator is epsilon k minus the real part of the self energy minus an imaginary part. So you can imagine that the role of the real part of the self energy must be fundamentally different than the imaginary part of the self energy. Okay. The real part of the self-energy doesn't look any different realistically than it, uh, it has some omega and k dependence, but it doesn't really look any different than epsilon k. Okay? So it is a renormalization of the energy scale. <clears throat> so if I have a dispersion, epsilon k, that goes as k squared, so I have some solid blue line, and then I absorb into epsilon k the real part of the self-energy, I now get some other term. And it's going to have a different slope. Okay. Now, <coughs> the idea in Fermi liquid theory is that you primarily care about what's going on right at the Fermi level. So you can essentially relate the slope here to, uh, I believe it's to an inverse velocity. <coughs> and you can see that. Since your epsilon k is proportional to 1 over m, is that the slope here tells you something about the effective mass scale. And when I add a real part of a self energy, I somehow change the slope. Okay? And um, let me think how I should draw this. 
did not intend to go through this in detail. So I have a slope, right? But now, uh, and this slope comes from epsilon k. But now I've, so this is delta omega, and this is some delta k. But then this real part of the self-energy has some shape as a function of omega. Uh, sorry, real part of self-energy as a function of omega. It also has some slope. Okay? So when you add those two functions, it means you add onto it an additional piece, which would look like delta, uh, delta omega of the self-energy, okay? like a derivative with respect to a frequency. And that means that if we ignore, uh, it could just as well also have a uh, delta k with the self-energy. Often this gets ignored, but formally it should still be there. And so what this means is that you've got an effective slope which is higher. OK? <clears throat> so within Fermi liquid theory, when you do an expansion of the self-energy around the Fermi level, that means around some point k equal to kf at a, on a Fermi surface, and at the omega equals 0 point, um, that you can define an effective renormalization scale. Okay? And this can be written in a number of ways. It, it, um, but the, the point is to rewrite omega minus epsilon k minus the real part of a self-energy as being approximately omega minus, uh, uh, I'm used to lambdas. Is it 1 plus, or is it just z? Uh, I'll have to think about this. It's either z epsilon k, or it's omega minus 1 plus z epsilon k. Um, I think it's just z epsilon k. I think there's a definition here of 1 plus lambda. So what this lets us do, uh, when I'm doing things on the fly here, I might have inverses here. So don't take these lines too seriously. What this lets us do is have a description of how the amplitude of uh, states near the Fermi level is changing. Okay? And it has a connection to a renormalization of the mass scale. It says we're going to take this, h bar squared k squared. We're going to take h bar squared k squared over 2m. Uh, plus the real part of the self-energy. And we're going to set that equal to h bar squared k squared over 2 m star. Okay? And you do that by taking a derivative. And this lets you write out what m star should be. And you would find that it looks like 1 minus m star over m would give you 1 minus the derivative with respect to the frequency of the real part of the self-energy evaluated right at the Fermi level. Okay? Um, However, uh, when you switch this to being in Matsubara frequencies, which is required for uh, the purposes of uh, uh, numerical work, which is all operating in Matsubara frequencies, this now becomes derivatives with respect to Matsubara frequencies. And that actually flips it, the, the behavior from being associated with the real part of the self-energy to the imaginary part of the self-energy, okay? just by the fact that you've added an extra i in. And the point is, when you go through a uh, metal insulator transition, this derivative basically becomes divergent. Okay? So here's some examples, but also um, another metric. So there's another metric people might use, and they call it this just delta sigma. Uh, here's an example from this paper by Park et al. I, omega, n are Matsubara bare frequencies. And we define delta sigma to be the difference between the imaginary part of the self-energy at the first Matsubara frequency, or the zeroth Matsubara frequency, minus the imaginary part of the self-energy at the first Matsubara frequency. And when this quantity is greater than zero, we say the system appears to be metallic, or showing metallic behavior. And when it's less than zero, it seems to be showing insulating behavior. Okay? This is not realistically much different from the previous definition, but it could potentially give you fundamentally different uh, crossover physics. Okay? So here are some examples as you increase this, the u in a system. So you can look at, for example, uh, just the red curve. Okay? And as you go from u equals 5 to 5.6 or 5.4, 5.8, is you can have different types of transitions. So here, um, 
delta sigma is just the difference between these two, first two frequencies. So you're asking, is the first frequency above the second one, or is it below? Okay? And at some point, it flips and becomes divergent the other way. Okay? So you would say that this looks to be uh, metallic for both of these curves. This appears to be metallic, and this appears to be insulating. These both appear to be metallic, but they've given it a name incoherent metal because it's somehow not tending towards zero, but some finite value. And here, you would say it's metallic and again insulating. Okay? So I just want to make a statement that you really have to be careful when comparing uh, numerical results in different manuscripts that are looking at different metrics for the same quantity. Okay? So while all of these things are indications of insulating behavior, you might actually be comparing, effectively, apples and oranges. Okay? You might actually somehow see a different transition. So this is where we get into, um, this is where we get into some issues, I think, uh, at least in, uh, in condensed matter physics. When you, when you consider the r level of rigor that goes into high energy physics experiments, um, the, the, the number of uh, cross checks and the amount of statistics that have to be gathered, and you compare that to some of the things that are done in condensed matter physics, um, condensed matter physics often comes up a little bit lacking when it comes to uh, rigor, error bars, uh, how certain are you, how reproducible is your data. Um, you, you can find in the literature two density functional theory calculations both using quantum espresso with the same mesh and the same pseudo potential, and you look at their graphs and they're visibly different. And, and at that stage, what do you do with that, right? And it's a big problem. Working on challenging problems in small groups means you can't get the right answer always, okay? You're gonna have some error, you're gonna have some approximation that's going on. So, you know, how it works in science, each group just chips away independently at their problem and they give their best guess and ultimately you want to try and arrange, uh, form some consensus, right? But this has a really bad side effect and I started my PhD working in high TC coupe rates and high TC coupe rates has been a particularly caustic field for many, many years. The side effect of, of this level of uncertainty is it actually breeds mistrust. And you hear things, I've, I've literally heard people say, you know, theorists don't know what they're doing. And uh, oh God, not another high TC talk, okay? Because people's now, people start to see it as, as, as bullshit rather than as scientific rigor, okay? So we have to be really careful because like, what does someone from outside of the field do when they look at this plot? And what do you think if you're a biologist and you look at this and you say, this group got that, and this group got that, and this group got that? What do you think? Right? Uh, I mean, there's reasons hidden, but at a quick, you know, quick look, at first blush, it looks like you guys don't know what you're doing. Okay? So um, <clears throat> I've only got a couple minutes left, and so this is a perfect uh, moment to talk about this collaboration that I've been a part of. This is the Simons Foundation collaboration on the many electron problem. Uh, most of you probably haven't heard of this, and that's okay. Uh, I'm, I'm painfully having to go through this slide because, uh, you know, I, uh, I get some support from them, so I need to, like, promote that group. It's really important stuff. But the idea was to bring together a bunch of people, a bunch of groups, a bunch of numerical techniques, and work together to try and solve some kind of problem with some level of rigor so that we could say, these are points, data sets that we know are correct, within some level or definition of the word correct, right? Some rigorous error bars, if possible, okay? Uh, and Liechtenstein was talking, again, about this uh, Flatiron Institute in New York, CCQ, which is the Center for Computational Quantum Physics. It's good for you guys to know if any of you work on highly computational problems. This is, a, I think, right now a big employer for uh, postdoc positions, so it's something you should have within your radar, okay? So this collaboration is basically vanishing Okay? And this is being replaced by a perpetual institute for uh, computational work specifically targeting uh, algorithm development to solve many body electron problems. So it's a really cool thing in this field that there's going to be an, an entire institute being dedicated towards this. And like I said, potentially a big employer for, uh, 
for some of you guys maybe in the future. The structure of what follows is, uh, and I can appreciate a little bit inverse of what one might normally do. Normally you might think I would introduce some uh, numerical technique and then I would tell you some results from it. Um, the problem is there's so many numerical techniques we'd spend all day sort of just talking about those. So th the intention instead is just to sort of show some kinds of results and some ideas of what come out of numerical techniques and I don't want you to worry about what the details of some specific technique are. Okay? Uh, later I'm going to tell you about a couple key ones because I'll show you more detailed calculations on those techniques and I want you to have an understanding of what dynamic mean field theory is and this sort of stuff. Okay? So I wanted to elaborate on this collaborative work. The idea of this collaboration was to take a bunch of people, put them together, and all together work on just the Hubbard model. Okay? I don't know how many millions of CPU hours were, were spent to good use on this model, but the idea was to have different numerical techniques. Okay? So we have all these friendly looking people, and we had dynamic cluster approximations, dual fermions, diagrammatic Monte Carlo, density matrix normalization group, density matrix embedding theory, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo, uh, unrestricted coupled clusters with single doubles, triples, quads, something. <laughs> <coughs> Anyways, keeps going, uh, as well as some additional general theory support. The idea is to take the idea was to take people from essentially all over the world and put a huge effort into establishing just single particle quantities of this model. Okay? So ideally, uh, energies, double occupancies, Green's functions, self-energies at different temperatures, so that this model, the Hubbard model, could be used as a playground for the development of new numerical techniques. Okay? So to, for the first time, really establish the exact results for some problem in some parameter set so when someone develops a new technique they have ex explicit benchmarks to compare to. Okay? So the Hubbard model uh, has been historically a very bad choice of model system. Right? I talked about how we wanted to take a real system and we said that real system is too hard so we're going to propose a model system. It turns out the Hubbard model is not a good model system because it doesn't hit that criteria that we can solve it like in some, with some direct numerical tool. So there's an additional level of abstraction that's required which is some level of an approximation, screen, approximation scheme and all of those numerical techniques exist in some context in some approximation scheme that take it from an interactable problem to a, an actually solvable one. Okay? And so the goal here is to have some, some tuning knob, right? some parameter, that allows you to systematically remove that approximation. Okay? And at some stage you can't go any further, but hopefully you're close enough to the answer that you can make some guess as you were to take that parameter and extend it to infinity and hope that it doesn't wildly change and that everything will be fine. Okay? So the idea is to take complementary techniques whenever possible. So, for example, comparison of diagrammatic Monte Carlo and dynamic cluster approximation. Those are complementary techniques. Diagrammatic Monte Carlo is a brute force evaluation of Feynman diagrams, like the stuff I was talking about yesterday, only not taking advantage of the uh, uh, new things I was talking about, uh, this algorithmic integration procedure. It's actually continuous in case space. So if something is evaluated in the Brillouin zone and it's continuous in, in momentum space, then it's effectively in the thermodynamic limit. Okay? So it's effectively solving an infinitely sized system. It is perturbative in the sense that it's actually quite hard. You need very, very high order diagrams to get an insulator out of a metal due to perturbation theory. Right? If your starting assumption is the system's a metal and you're going to do perturbation theory, but your, sol your final solution is an insulator, you are so far from your, your goal that your perturbation theory is a really, really hard task. Okay? Then there are other methods. Uh, this comparison is a dynamic cluster approximation, which is a cluster uh, extension of dynamical mean field theory, which again I haven't really introduced, but it has very coarse-grained patches in momentum space, which says that it does not have uh, very good uh, momentum resolution. 
Okay? It is a effectively small system size, so it, it might be limited to a 10 by 10 system in some context, which is nowhere near a thermodynamic limit, but it has the advantage that it uses this dynamical mean field uh, sort of back end, and that is effectively a non-perturbative procedure. Okay? It very happily obtains insulating solutions when you give it a metallic solution. And both of these methods occur at finite temperature, and I put some really uh, misleading arrows on these graphs that help you to, to come to some conclusion that they actually point at the same uh, values, while you, of course, have very large error bars right by those, uh, those points. But as a function of some small parameter, okay, they can limit that parameter towards zero, and they can find essentially convergence to some value. And within some uh, you know, uh, large uncertainty, um, now, I say large, but the uh, axis scale here is on the, the order of 10 to the minus 3. So on some particular scale, this is agreement. Okay? This is agreement within about 10 to the minus 3. One is being extrapolated in a perturbative order of expansion. The other being extrapolated in increasing the system size. Okay? So you have these two very different techniques that are showing agreement. So that's the goal. I'm not going to show you all the data that's in this paper. Um, it's here in a PRX paper. And whether or not this has utility for you or for anyone else really boils down to what is the scale you're interested in. If you're studying uh, superconductivity, you might uh, care uh, about a, what is the, the scale of your superconducting gap. And a superconducting gap might be anywhere from 4 milli electron volts to 25 milli electron volts. Um, pseudo gaps maybe are in the realm of 30 to 75 milli electron volts. And you know, 1% of your hopping is maybe 3 milli electron volts, okay? So if you can get 1% certainty between techniques, that's pretty much uh, an acceptable scale where you can start to make meaningful statements about the physics of superconductivity and pseudo gaps, okay? About finite temperature phase transitions. So all the techniques have something to say about that. There are tables uh, essentially produced within that publication and you'll see that some techniques agree within 10 to the minus 4 for some data points, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 3. So there's some scale of agreement but by just putting all that data out there we can have a very good estimate within some certainty of what the values actually should be. Okay? <clears throat> However, it turns out that distinguishing the order of ground states uh, for example directly on a wave function requires substantially finer resolution. It turns out that as you approach the ground states, you have many, many very close in energy, low-lying ground states that are possible, and uh, sorting that out requires a lot more work. And other people have tried to do that. So the takeaway message... Can you yeah. quantify that? Like how far are we from doing that? To the um, that this paper in Science by Steve White on... on um, charge order, spatial charge order, is essentially that was the issue with identifying what is the ground state phase. And that's a different group of techniques, all at t equals zero, all trying to understand spatial charge ordering. And uh, a lot of work went into them determining what was, in fact, the lowest lying charge order configuration. Now, uh, whether or not that's the final word, I don't know. But there are other papers that have also seen that. But it's a very controversial topic, okay? Right. So the takeaway message is really that it's, it's no longer acceptable, at least in condensed matter computational work, to simply present approximate results from numerics without at least placing your results clearly in some framework of what is your expectation for correctness, okay? Um, your, your calculations have to have some strength that is somehow distinct from the fact that it's uh, numerically incorrect in some way. Okay. <clears throat> now, sadly, that big collaborative work. So I made a big fuss about this plot that has this discrepancy. This big collaborative work, after I don't know, even even now, after two to three years afterwards, we still have not resolved this. Okay, and the reason for it is that trying to understand if this thing here is correct is really hard. It turns out that in the Hubbard model, as your interaction gets small, 
you think that, OK, this should be easy because it's a small interaction. My perturbation theory should work very well. The problem is that because the interaction strength, which is local, is small, it turns out the correlation length scale is very large. So when you come to finite size effects, the finite size effects become a dominant contribution to things like phase transitions, which is precisely why this changes so much with finite system size. So on the right hand side, we have some, uh, some data sets from dynamic cluster approximation for different increasing system sizes. And at high temperature, they're very systematic. One could maybe make some extrapolation. But as you come to low temperature, the difference in system size is monstrous. It's absolutely huge. Okay? So there's essentially no meaning to the fact that you got a certain result from a uh, 128 site calculation at t of uh, 0 0.05. It essentially means nothing, because if you increase the system size just a little bit, it'll change by 30 or 40 percent. Okay? So finding convergence with system size is really challenging. So it's things like this that force new numerical techniques to be developed, right? With specific targets in mind or specific goals or problems in mind. So we've been working on this for a while. It's unpublished data. I'm not even going to say what it's from, but we're able to come up with similar type curves to this D gamma A, where we also have this low uh, U type uh, curve. But we think it looks more exponential, not linear. Okay? But it's not been published because uh, if we have results from only one numerical technique, we have no idea if we have some internal bias. And it's proved quite a challenge to show that that can actually be removed. Okay? Uh, and as I already sort of gave away, there's also other issues. For example, right as you go towards t equals 0, that there are a series of low-lying stripe order phases that it turns out are a very serious challenge to address. And there's been some subset of this Simons collaboration that published a paper in Science where they tried to understand different charge stripe orderings of different lattice spacing lengths and, un and try and figure out which ones, in fact, had the lowest energy states. Okay? So the goal, ultimately, is to extend beyond the Hubbard model and push towards real systems. So um, some of this was written down by Liechtenstein at some point. A uh, guy talked, I think, a little bit about non-local interactions. So I'm going to give some presentation of some results from uh, what can be done for metal insulator transitions with non-local interactions and how that produces charge ordering. So that's a new phase that comes out, um, which I sort of alluded to the charge ordering existing just in the Hubbard model. Um, but everything I'm going to present uh, is, so none of this is my work. and. Um, here we get into dangerous waters, because as soon as you put a non-local interaction, if you're doing Monte Carlo calculations, uh, you basically have what's referred to as a Monte Carlo sign problem, always. And so the system sizes that can be addressed are substantially smaller. So none of this is uh, rigorous in the same sense. Okay? Uh, there are cases where it works well, and there's cases where it doesn't, and you're sort of at the, the mercy of just the physics that's there, and at the mercy of what computations, how many cycles you have available to you. <clears throat> so we know that non-local effects, non-local interactions in materials are important. One of the arguments for a Hubbard model is the idea that long-range interactions are screened by all the other electrons in the system. But clearly, that's not going to be perfect screening so that it's only local. Um, so there's you know, lots of evidence in the literature of uh, very sizable non-local interactions. There's many systems for which this is relevant. Um, uh, right. So what I'm going to primarily focus on is charge ordering rather than screening. Okay, and what's referred to as a Wigner-Mott transition, or spatial charge ordering, which can occur. And this is different from uh, a second order type, type phase transition of uh, the emergence of plasmon modes, which has a divergence in some element of a susceptibility, okay? or charge susceptibility showing a divergence. Okay? And you're gonna, we're going to see phase diagrams that have charge order and metal and they're always going to have a very similar structure to this sort of very universal quantum critical point picture, 
where you have two phases on either side, you have some curve that comes through the middle, and you may or may not have any phase transition. You may have a crossover at high temperatures. <clears throat> right, so the idea is that if you want to step from the Hubbard model to real systems, that you would do some sort of expansion that allows you to have not just local U interaction that has a, a ni up, ni down, but also include a v term, which for uh, reasons of this summation involve a factor of two, for ni and nj that could have spin ups or spin downs. Okay. <clears throat> so this is typically considered to be the minimal model used to study spatial charge ordering in correlated systems. It's also used to study superconductivity in organic materials, quantum phase transitions, screening effects, etc. So the idea is that you would go from a uniform phase, okay, where the red dots here are just sort of representations of the density at each uh, lattice site. You would go from some uniform phase to some charge ordered phase where certain lattice sites have essentially no red dots and other lattice sites have more red dots. So for whatever reason, um, despite the fact that you, again, you typically would expect some uh, translationally invariant system because you have a lattice, but the details of your interaction result in you, all of your electrons deciding to clump up in a different pattern, which somehow minimizes their energy. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay, I'm gonna. S yeah, sorry. So charge order is something that is seen experimentally. Uh, I'm most familiar uh, with it from cuprate physics. So in the top panel here, these are all cuprate materials. We have lanthanum copper, or sorry, uh, sorry, that's not a cuprate. This is bismuth strontium calcium copper oxide, and this is, uh, bismuth, this is the same material, bismuth 2212. So depending on your temperature that you look at, you can get complicated uh, structure patterns of density. So these curves come explicitly from STM results. So they take an STM tip and they essentially move it across the surface and they try and measure the density of states as they move across and they find that there are more electrons in certain uh, lattice sites than others and they form complicated patterns. Okay. Charge order is uh, a distinct feature of lots of other uh, metal oxides. Okay. Uh, so you'll have uh, high temperature superconductors that have uh, a antiferromagnetic phase, a superconducting phase, and there's a lot of literature in the last uh, maybe eight years on the existence of a charge ordering dome, which also occurs inside that superconducting dome. So this is one of the reasons why high TC cuprates is such a, uh, I say, awful field, because it's not just a superconductor. It's a lot of things. So you have regions here where you have possible phase competition between a pseudogap phase, if the pseudogap's even a phase because that's not a well understood or, or, or known fact. Charge ordering, whether or not the charge ordering is uh, specific to all cuprates or just certain ones, as well as a superconducting phase. And add on top of that that people don't quite have a full grasp of the details that go into what causes the superconducting phase. Right, good. So the point is that the origin of charge ordering and its interplay with other types of ordering might not be universal. It, at least uh, with what is presented in the literature, it's very dependent upon the details of a particular material. And this is very problematic for computational work if you have some effective model and uh, every different material has a different set of parameters, then this makes it very hard to make you know, concrete statements about actual material physics. So we're primarily just gonna focus on, on what the model itself gives. This is also a much harder problem because I, I've already sort of alluded that the phase diagram in terms of where this metal insulator transition occurs, the phase diagram of the Hubbard model when V is equal to zero, that part of the phase diagram is not rigorously understood. And there are a lot of people still studying the extended Hubbard model, which now adds an entire new axis, this V. Okay, so you're starting from a model that's not understood and then you're extending beyond that to have not any more understanding, okay? But trying to understand what are some distinct features of electron-electron interaction driven uh, charge order effects is really sort of the goal of that work. So as I mentioned, when U is much bigger than V, typically you have everything very uniform, okay? 
But when v becomes a dominant uh, contribution, you'll wind up with some sort of charge order. <coughs> OK, so primarily in this section, I'm going to present results that, are, again, are not my own. They're primarily from uh, Hannah Terletska, a variety of papers uh, that she's worked on, and uh, her various collaborators over the years. Uh, and they all use dynamical cluster approximation, which is one of the, the methods that I talked about. Uh, it's a non-local and non-perturbative approximation. It includes short range at effects. Uh, non-local effects are treated uh, within a cluster explicitly, and really long range beyond the cluster are essentially truncated. Okay? In order to deal with broken symmetries, of course, they have to actually uh, play some games with their chemical potentials and allow that each lattice site could be distinct. Okay? So somehow in their numerical calculations, they do have to bias their system. Okay? And that's a detail of what's referred to as the dynamical mean field self-consistency, is that if they don't do that, then they effectively average out those spatial effects. Okay. So here's a pot potential phase diagram. Uh, and they've identified an order parameter. So this is supposed to be a talk about phases. If we can identify an order parameter, then we have something to talk about. So if we have this, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, lattice broken into A sites and B sites, and we have a density NA on the A sites on average, and a density NB on average on the B sites, we can define an order parameter to be the difference. That order parameter goes to zero when you're in a uniform phase, and it would be finite when there's a difference between those densities. Okay? And then for some choice of u, you can plot that delta n as a function of v. And here are some results for, our, for our points below that transition and above that transition. Okay? And what you see is you go from a metal for some small v value to a case where you're already um, starting to see charge ordering. But when you look at the density of states at the Fermi level, you still see that it's metallic. Okay? So you have the existence of charge ordering, but electrons are still flowing in the system. And as uh, V increases further, um, you're still within a charge ordered phase, but the density of states drops to zero, and you've become an insulator. Okay? So this says that the metal insulator transition in the extended Hubbard model is a lot more complicated because we have the combination of a metal insulator and we also have a charge ordering. So we have the ability to have a charge ordered metal and a charge ordered insulator because those are not uh, going to line up with each other. Okay? So this is a picture on some relative scale that was generated to describe uh, relatively what that looks like. So the size of those, those dots essentially is a proportionality to the density on each site. And this is the definition of that charge ordering. So these are just snapshots of site densities for those same points uh, along that V curve that I showed in the previous plot. <coughs> OK? Uh, sorry. Yeah, there we go. Right. So um, all of this can be done. Um, and we can try and understand the role of finite size effects. And depending on the temperatures that you have and depending on the interaction strengths you have, it can actually be the case that, you know, I talked about these issues with finite size effects. Um, it can actually be the case that putting non-local interactions reduces your effective correlation scale. It's not always the case, but for some parameters, uh, if it reduces your average correlation scale, then you don't have nearly as bad finite size effects. So there are some cases where they've actually been able to increase their system size and see very little variation in where those transitions occur. And that's really good. So it's actually quite non-intuitive that you start from this Hubbard model and you create it where you don't know the phase diagram. And at least for certain cases, for charge ordering, as you add V onto it, you actually become a, it actually becomes a more tractable problem, even though you have issues of sign problems and all this kind of thing, because the correlation length scales decline, you can actually converge things effectively within finite size scaling. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, that's not supposed to be there. <clears throat> so, just in some qualitative way, we can see that um, you can define some critical v value. Okay, along this scale where that transition occurs. Okay. 
And you see that it basically increases with the on-site interaction, u. Okay, so there's some relative scaling between u and v. So if u increases, then v has to increase in order to get the same transition. Okay. And vc also increases with uh, temperature increasing. Okay. So the, this, as a result, between the, the TUV phase diagram actually results in a very complicated phase diagram, which is nowhere near being complete. Um, finite, sex, finite size effects are, um, are possible, and there's no way to know when those will crop up other than to do finite size scaling of some numerical technique. Okay? Okay. Uh, sorry, I already said all of these words. So I'm actually going to skip to this part here. So then you hit a point where you say, okay, we think we have some control over what we're doing. Let's start to do some comparisons to other numerical techniques and try and gain an understanding of how well we do. <clears throat> so this is a plot as a function of, uh, sorry, in the VU plane. So we have our non-local interaction here, and we have our local interaction here. And it's a plot of where you go from charge ordering to metallic, okay, where that phase occurs for different numerical techniques. We have, uh, what do we have in here? We have extended DMFT plus GW. We have a dual boson technique, which was probably, uh, I believe this exact slide was shown by Liechtenstein last week. It's probably, uh, uh, I believe it's coming from this publication, but the dual boson data almost certainly was coming from uh, his group or uh, Hofferman. There's also DCA data, uh, extended DMFT, and you see that there's uh, quite a, a variation, but those are mostly finite size effects. But I want to emphasize that other than the dual boson technique, which is uh, quite different from this small system DCA, this is nowhere near the level of making some sort of concrete conclusions as to what this phase diagram looks like. Okay? So there's still a lot of work to be done. So people start to draw um, more colorful plots where they start to um, try and understand where you go from a metal, metallic phase to a charge ordered metal to a charge ordered insulator or other parameter regimes where you just have generally it goes straight from metallic to insulating and you can create that charge ordering right away. Okay? So this is, a, this is something I'm going to emphasize because I found it to be a big point of confusion for me. Um, this is uh, basically coming from this paper down here. Uh, these are two of the same data sets uh, shown on a different axis. Um, so the, uh, the red curve is the data in the charge ordered insulator phase as a function of chemical potential. So this is a, a statement of at which temperature for a given chemical potential, do you get that transition? So that transition is highest in temperature when mu is zero. So uh, I'm a little bit unclear from what they've done, whether or not mu equals zero is actually half filled, okay, relative to a half filling point, um, or if it's uh, uh, scaled by some additional value, okay? But that would be my guess, is that mu equals, mu equals zero relates to a half filling. And essentially, you're seeing that the largest transition occurs at half filling, and as they dope the system, that transition decays, okay, and eventually uh, goes towards t equals zero, most likely. But this is very misleading because if you replot this as a function of the dopant, like what is the doping value, rather than the chemical potential, you see that, um, uh, yeah, so mu equals zero relates to uh, half filling, okay, um, where one is half filling. And uh, sorry, where zero here is half filling. And you can see that these phases here in this region of chemical potential are actually not distinct phases. Okay? Because as a function of chemical potential, probably due to some sort of insulating behavior, is this entire range of chemical potential has no change in density. Okay? So those two curves essentially are lining directly up with each other as a function of density instead of a fun function of chemical potential. So just be very wary when you look at experimental results. The difference between density and mu is not necessarily straightforward when you go to insulating systems. Okay? You can have huge variations in chemical potential that don't change your density at all. All right. So this, was, this, is, this is the problem, and it remains an ongoing problem, which is to try and identify that entire phase di diagram in uh, 
t and mu and sorry t and u and v, okay? And to understand the competition between all of these phases. So at high temperatures, you're going to have a uniform phase. At large u values, you're going to have an insulating phase. And at large v values, you're going to start to get charge ordering. Okay? You can also ask other questions about whether or not those transitions are kinetic energy driven or potential energy driven. So this is something I didn't talk about yet, is as you go across a phase transition, there's a lot of history of this in superconductivity, is what is the source energetically of that phase transition? Is it potential energy driven or is it kinetic energy driven? So as theorists, we have the ability to really separate those objects and we can go ahead and plot the kinetic energy or the potential energy, HU or HV, as a function of some parameter, in this case V, and as you go through that transition, in this particular case, you see that the kinetic energy drops off while the potential energy rises drastically for the, uh, I believe it's HV increases rapidly and HU de increases due to increased double occupancy. Okay? So this is another interesting thing you can do when looking at phase transitions is ask about what, is the, what are the energetics of that phase transition. Is it the kinetic part? Is it the potential energy part? Okay, so I, I want to summarize that stuff because I find it to be a more mundane subject, but a natural extension of I'm going to talk about the Hubbard model. Okay? Uh, I feel that I can't just tell you about the Hubbard model without telling you about extensions beyond that, so that you don't get the feeling like everyone in the world works on Hubbard models, because that's just not the case. I think everyone thinks about Hubbard models. Everyone thinks about Hubbard models because they want to have a baseline as a foundation upon which to build your, your extensions beyond the Hubbard model, right? So that if you solve all these things that have uh, non-local Vs, you know you have a V equals zero limit that should map onto the Hubbard model, and you want to know what the Hubbard model was so that you can know your answers are correct, okay? <clears throat> all right, so just in summary of this section, electron, electron interactions are very important. You get these exotic phases like charge ordering. Um, you know, at least in the context I've presented here, uh, I don't know why we would care about charge ordering. But maybe in some material design or fabrication, charge, creating a material where electrons are fundamentally charge ordered might have computing technology applications, right? And really being able to understand that and tune that might have uh, you know, a meaningful repercussion. Okay? So I haven't been focusing on that, but there's real reasons why you might care about charge ordering. So we really need proper, non-perturbative numerical methods in order to really make further progress on those problems. And today's story was mostly about MOT, quantum critical, and charge ordering due to non-local site interactions, okay? So that's what was presented here. There's more. There's more extensions that are considered standard. So I've talked about, uh, all right. So as we push towards real systems, we can, for example, include multiband systems. We have our non-interacting Hamiltonian, which just looks like our tight binding dispersion. We can then include local and non-local interactions, so we can have U terms. We can have U prime terms and further extensions of those which have to be included if we include uh, what's called Hun's coupling, which allows for um, spin flips, okay? So the, each of these terms allows for different transitions between orbitals, so, okay? So the U is an interaction between two electrons on the same site in the same orbital, or, orbital while the U primes are interactions between sites on different orbitals. The U prime minus J is when they are of the same spin because the J terms know about uh, interactions that allow the spins themselves to hop around between orbitals, okay? So as you extend from a single band picture to a multiband problem, your complications grow. And there are some things known about these models, but uh, I'm not going to go into them. But again, I, w I want you to have this understanding that at least at this stage, the, the case where j is 0, u prime is 0, is still not a fully solved problem. Okay? So that's why I, I focus on the Hubbard model so much. <clears throat> I've got, what, 10 minutes? Pretty much. Cool. So I'm going to start on what is the second from last segment. 
So maybe I'll run out of time by the end, but we'll see. Um, so what I want to talk about next, I'm going to sort of bring it back to things that I think, that, things that I'm more familiar with anyways. And I'm going to talk about some of these numerical methods. I'm going to actually try and explain to you what DMFT is and what, what some of its extensions are, dynamical cluster approximation. I'm going to talk about dual fermion method because I think it's a really cool tool. I'm going to talk about diagrammatic Monte Carlo because that's something I'm currently interested in. And I think that just being able to do high order perturbation theory is a really interesting um, and powerful thing. And in there, you're going to see some things that you'll recognize from the very first lecture. Yeah, you have a question? Yes, so why are you going to talk about DMFT if it's not an infinite um, size method? If that, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, the reason is that the other methods are extensions explicitly on top of DMFT. Okay? So the idea with DMFT, which I'll get into, is you, you solve just a single site. But you can, in the same type of framework, solve a bigger system. And those are these cluster extensions. And I'll talk about this dual fermion technique that instead uses two particle properties to try and get um, physics of long ranges correct. And then it sort of interpolates in between. Okay? So these are, um, these are some methods. They're not restricted. They're not necessarily the best given what one is trying to do. The reason why people study them for the Hubbard model is because DMFT even for the single site problem, will go from a metal to an insulator. So if you're studying a model where you know you have a metal insulator transition, it's, a, it's potentially a good starting point, okay? not necessarily the best. So what you'll see uh, is a lot of stuff that should resonate from my very first lecture, where I talked about hubbard stratonovic decoupling. And there are other decoupling schemes. Okay? And I'll talk about duality in the context only of this dual fermion method. Uh, and in fact, Liechtenstein went through that in uh, pretty rigorous detail. So you'll see that uh, I cut two or three slides out that kind of go through what he went through, uh, and I'll do the more uh, hand wavy uh, caricature uh, type explanation of what it means, OK? OK, so. <clears throat> The logic and flow of this talk is to say, now we've talked about some of the repercussions of phase transitions and what those phase transitions are in kind of more detail maybe than I should have. <laughs> and so I want to identify what are some of the tools and what are some of the observables that people might look at. And I want you know, to try and give an idea that if you're a student or postdoc, you know, where do you fit in? What should you work on if you were to decide to start working on Hubbard models? Uh, you can ignore this part because I already did it. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is dynamical mean field theory, diag MC, and dual fermions. And I'll make a little bit of a distinction between ladders and uh, dual fermion plus diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So an introduction to dynamical mean field theory. Probably should say something else. What do you do when you, have, when you have mean field theory? When you have mean field theory, you say, I have a bunch of electrons, right? And I know that they all interact with each other, right? Through a Coulomb interaction. And I have 10 to the 23 of them. And so that's a hard problem to just directly solve even though you know how to write down the, the uh, equation that you want to solve. Okay? So you have all of these electrons. And so a mean field theory says, I'm going to put a single electron in a, in a bath or in a mean field of the other 10 to the 23 electrons. right? And that mean field causes a renormalization. And when you're done, what you get out of that is a single number, typically. You get an energy or a free energy. You get one number that comes out. Okay? I'm going to show you in a second that dynamical mean field theory does a little bit more. It's a little bit different. So the idea is to map a lattice problem onto an impurity problem. 
So we have this lattice of ions. And for example, I have this little gray uh, um, lattice site here. And I'm showing hopping T that is coming from the kinetic term. And I'm going to have a U interaction. But at this stage, I'm not drawing electrons on the problem. And we replace our lattice with just a single site. And electrons can hop from that site and into what's called the bath. Okay? So electrons can now jump from that site into a mean field bath and back. And that mean field bath could have any number of uh, degrees of freedom. When you do this, it turns out that the resulting self-energy is uh, completely local, because you have only one lattice site, which means when you do the Fourier transform, it's completely flat in k-space. It has no k-dependence. Okay? So what one does in dynamical mean field theory is it says, assume the bath looks like something. And assume the bath is, for example, a non-interacting problem. And solve this impurity problem okay, of a single site coupled to a bath. Once you've found that solution, you say, OK, well, let's let the bath be that solution. So now I have a single site coupled to a bath that has been solved once. And that produces a slightly different solution. And you iterate on that until the impurity and the bath have, in, in effect, converged to each other. And what that means is you hopefully have some meaningful physical solution. Yep? What is it in Hilbert space? Well, uh, in, at least in this case, the, the simplest starting point is a known solution. And you can take any starting solution you like. But uh, the most straightforward one is a known solution where you say, if I was to set, I solve a problem with a u. But if I set u to 0, I know the solution to that problem. OK? Because that's the non-interacting problem. Guy was talking about that last, yesterday. Okay? So I, I'm going to set the bath to be that solution as a starting point. Okay? Now, when it comes to these phase transitions, um, uh, I talked about hysteresis. In order to get hysteresis, I would have to make a different assumption on the starting point of that bath. Like say, the starting point of the bath is not a, f uh, a non-interacting metal, but the starting point of that bath is, an, is a highly interacting insulator, or something like that. Okay? And you will actually get different solutions at certain points in, in phase space, near phase transitions. But otherwise, no matter what starting solution, you should still uh, obtain the same uh, result. Now, there's no formal mathematical requirement that you obtain convergence of that procedure. So it is possible to choose a starting solution that lies out of some radius of convergence and won't converge at all. OK? You mean the bath is actually modeled as a node 20 sites or something? There are, it, it's very dependent upon how you're actually solving this. You can, you can think of it as having some number of degrees of freedom in a Hilbert space. I think that was sort of your question. And you can give that Hilbert space as many degrees of freedom as you're able to handle if you wanted to do, for example, an, an exact diagonalization type solver. OK? Um, yeah. So, so that is a good question, because people who do ED solvers, they literally couple it. They say they have a lattice site, and it is coupled to some finite number of bath states. Okay? So electrons can jump from the lattice site to a bath state. And that is a finite element in a, Hil in a Hilbert space that they intend to diagonalize. Okay? Great question. All right. So the difference between mean field theory and dynamical mean field theory is we're not talking about one electron. We're talking about one lattice site. Okay? It's a different object that's your object for doing mean field. And so dynamical mean field theory is where you just sit and you watch that lattice site. And you watch it as a function of time or as a function of complex time. It doesn't particularly matter. And you just watch as electrons hop on or off of that lattice site from bath sites. Okay? <coughs> so what we've done is we've reduced the system to a single site. And electrons are able to hop on or off of it into this you know, surrounding mean field bath of states. And this creates a dynamic process, unlike mean field theory. Mean field theory gives you one number out, gives you essentially an energy. Dynamical mean field theory gives you dynamics. You can create a correlation function that says, what is my Green's function as a function of time? Okay? 
So that is the difference between mean field theory and dynamical mean field theory. One number versus literally dynamics as a function of time. Okay? However, as I mentioned, the reduction to a single site now contains no k-dependence.